Sure. <laughs> sure. So, uh, of course, Venerable Yonten, uh, she was our very precious teacher here for about three years, I think, um, as our resident teacher. The world is now so fortunate to have Venerable travelling as a um, FPMT teacher, so Venerable is travelling to centres and uh, teaching, so it's wonderful. Um, and I think what's wonderful too is we have a lot of FPMT centres that don't have resident teachers and don't have guests, we're one. Um, but Venerable does give some priority to those centres so that if we don't have teachers then she tries to get to our centres at least once or twice a year, I hope, hope more often. Um, but we're very fortunate. So, Venerable, thank you for coming. Oh, sure. Well, so please, <laughs> come here. Um, please, please come many, 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 many times again. Uh, this is your kind of home, <laughs> away from home, your home in the mountains. Thanks, Craig. And we're just so fortunate to have you here. So, thank you, Venerable. Oh, thanks very much. It's, <clears throat> it's nice to be back. <clears throat> it does feel like home, um, even though I don't know all y'all. So um, anyway, thanks for having me. Um, let's uh, just start by setting the tone of the weekend by reading the four immeasurable thoughts. So in your little prayer book, it's just right in the middle on page seven. <clears throat> and uh, about three quarters down the page, it says the short prayer of the four immeasurables. So we'll just say these together and then just sit with it for a moment. Is that all right? May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings never be separated from the happiness that is without suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from both attachment and hatred, holding some close and others distant. So just sitting with what you can draw from those words already. And then just thinking to yourself, the reason I come to a course like this is to deepen my ability to live by love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. And in that way, leading a meaningful life, a beneficial life for both myself and others. And whatever comes after this life as well. So you can relax your attention. <clears throat> so this course, um, we're going to do <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit of analytical meditation in the Tibetan Buddhist style. And then we're going to do um, a bit of just a straight kind of presentation. And then um, time for question and answer and discussion for those folks that are um, into discussing and processing <laughs> verbally. And those of you that are not into processing verbally, you can stay nice and quiet and just observe. We're not going to put any pressure on you, OK? So um, I'll try and kind of divide up the sessions roughly 20 minutes presentation, 20 minutes meditation, 20 minutes of Q&A. But it'll, of course, I'll fall apart after the first session. Um, <laughs> but that's the general idea. So. Um, the four immeasurable thoughts, I think, are um, a particularly good uh, topic for everyone to know, Buddhist or non-Buddhist, um, super Buddhist or casually Buddhist. Um, and the reason is that they were actually taught to a non-Buddhist audience. Um, there was, uh, during the time of the Buddha, there were many instances where he taught these four immeasurable thoughts. Um, he taught it from the perspective of the Pali tradition and the Theravadan folks. He taught it from the perspective of the Sanskrit tradition and the Mahayana folks. He taught it in all sorts of different contexts. But he also taught it to non-Buddhists. And the way it came about was, um, it's described in this Kama, uh, Kala Mahasutra, where um, there were these practitioners who were you know, seekers and had been getting a lot of different teachers in. Yeah, and you can even see this happening in the Blue Mountains, can't you? There was just a lot of teachers. A lot of them had really interesting things to say, but there was some contradiction, and people were getting a bit confused, you know, what to do, how to live their life. Um, there, were, there was wisdom they could draw from all of these teachers, but some of them would say, oh, no, the guy that came just before, he was wrong. Yeah, I'm the one who has the answer. And, you know, so folks were getting a bit tangled. And... They heard about the Buddha's reputation, but they were not Buddhist. 
but they were curious, you know, because they were obviously seekers in the mood for a chat about these things. And so when the Buddha was coming near, they requested him to come and give his take on all of this. And my impression is that they were still kind of taking it with a grain of salt, right? They weren't necessarily going to buy what this Buddha was talking about, but they were curious because they knew him by reputation. And what happened was is that the Buddha said, your doubts are good, your arguments are good, investigating through your own experience is essential, and you don't need to believe anything I say. He kind of started with that premise. Yeah, you don't have to believe anything I say. It was quite a different approach than what they'd been hearing, which was you must believe everything I say or you're going to hell or you're going to take endless rebirth or you're going to do this or you're going to do that. It was very not what they were used to hearing. Um, and I can picture them sort of pricking up their ears going, hmm, different? Okay. <laughs> and, and so what the Buddha recommended in this and many other um, sutras and teachings on this topic was just check for yourself if your life is better. Just check for yourself if your life is better, if you embody these qualities. Experiment with them actively. Think about them with logic. Think about them with your memory. Try them out and then reflect back. So you don't have to take my word for it. Yeah, just really play with it and experiment with it. And because these four are very um, accessible concepts, aren't they? They're quite universal concepts. No one is sort of like anti-love in their life, right? Unless they've really had it tough, yeah? And even so, um, even if they don't use those words, they still want it, right? So I think it's a very interesting approach that the Buddha took, which was to say, experiment with it and decide for yourself. And that's the approach he actually brought to all of his teachings. But for this particular group in particular, he said, you don't have to be a Buddhist to practice this. You don't have to take my word for it to take it on board. Just, if it makes sense, have a go. And you probably wouldn't even be a seeker if you weren't already interested in these. It's not like the first time you thought compassion was a good idea. You know, the Buddha didn't have to mention compassion for it to occur to you to be a good thing. Your life has already shown that. Does that make sense? So he was kind of... Um, meeting people where they are and touching those universal truths. And so this is one of the teachings that really goes across every tradition and probably every great religious tradition has a version of talking about these concepts. And um, right off the bat, even when the Buddha taught it, he basically was saying, I don't have the copyright on this. You know, I'm not the only one that knows this, um, but here's some techniques to develop it. So he taught it um, in the Metta Sutra as well. And this is a sutra from the Pali tradition where he also went into using these to develop different forms of concentration, different parts of um, vipassana, insight, meditation. And so these are sort of higher meditations um, that also go together with the four immeasurable thoughts, and you achieve what are called jhanas. And this is um, an aspect of the four measurables that's a little bit more um, intensive, and so we'll just see how we go today. And depending how the group's going today, we may or may not cover it tomorrow, just depending on how quickly you're catching on. <laughs> and, um, and if we don't get to it, maybe we can do it another time, or you can ask Geshele to teach it to you. So um, know that that's another piece of these four immeasurable thoughts. So <clears throat> the first one, love. When you hear the word love, um, what do you think it means just from your life so far? You either say it to yourself or say it out loud, your choice. But when you hear the word love, what does it mean? Something so obvious, we probably say to our loved ones often, <coughs> what does it even mean? Caring, yeah, caring. Yep, caring for someone, um, caring for their welfare, caring about what makes them happy <laughs> and may fulfilled. Happy. Yep, may, may they be, be happy. May they be happy, exactly. <coughs> exactly. Um, what looks like love, but isn't? What is something that might have the appearance of love, the words of love, but isn't? Yeah. Infatuation. Oh, certainly, yes. <laughs> Infatuation, <laughs> yes. Yep. Possession. Yeah. yeah, possession, neediness, yep. Romantic love. Good Romantic love often, yeah, is not love, yeah. 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 Good old lust. Yeah, lust can look like love. You can be so nice to people when you have lust, right? But it's because you want something from them. <laughs> Creepy, right? Um, 
poor teenagers. Um, <laughs> right? right? Um, and I mean, isn't that sort of um, worldly wisdom too, that if you stay together after the flush of lust kind of settles to a dull roar, then you're in it for the long haul. Um, and have you noticed that there, there can be trends um, in people getting into relationships where they seem to change partners every two years? Mm. Yeah, and they say science, science often rec says that the, the pheromones, the kind of like yay feeling, <laughs> I don't know, uh, it's, it sort of wears off after about two years. Yeah, so people think something's wrong when in fact the chemicals have just settled. Yeah. So um, it is interesting because most of our relationships that have love as a component also have things that look like love but aren't. And so it becomes very difficult for us to tease out which is which. And it becomes very difficult for us to understand why we're disappointed and why we're upset with our loved ones because we don't realize that we're the ones giving ourselves that let down feeling because of the things that look like love but aren't. Yeah. So we'll tease that out a little bit. Um, you know, this is just the overview session. So then thinking about compassion, uh, what's compassion mean in words, in experience? You know, to identify with how they feel. So. Mm, identifying with how they feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's an element of that in it. It's huge, yeah. Yeah, what else is a component of compassion? May they not suffer. May they not suffer. May they not suffer. Yep. May, not may they not suffer because they're horrible to live with when they're suffering, right? <laughs> Which is sometimes what it, it functions as, right? We do want them free from suffering because they're hell to live with when they're suffering, not because just full stop, that's what we wish for them. So again, with our relationships, it gets quite tangled quite quickly with what is the real motivation, what is the real thing that's happening here? Um, and we go back and forth between kind of a clean, clear, pure version and a more tangled, distorted, afflicted version with the same relationships, right? It's, you know, never mind the ones that it's totally distorted here and totally pure here. That's less likely to happen. It's mm -hmm. usually the same relationships. It can go either way. And again, conflict comes when we've kind of gone to the dark side. Uh, what looks like compassion but isn't? Pity, exactly. Yeah, pity. What it, what else looks like compassion but isn't? Or even guilt. Guilt can, yeah, guilt can. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, thinking, you know, when you've either been on the receiving end or on the giving end, what is something that seemed like it was compassionate but it didn't ring true? When people have like trying to do the nice thing, do the good thing, try to support you, but it hasn't been support. Charity. Charity. Yeah, the wrong kind of charity. Kind. Yep. Duty. Duty. Yes, duty. <laughs> duty. Yep. Um, advice. Advice. Yeah. Untimely, unsolicited <laughs> advice. Yeah. Yeah. Classics. Yeah. Yeah. Like this. Um, and then so joy. Joy is, um, of all of the four, can be kind of the most abstract to nail down, especially in terms of how to practice and develop it. Because does it work to say, have joy, go, do it now, right? <laughs> especially if you're in a dark mood and you're just like not into it. It's, it's you know, it feels cheesy, right? It feels American, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> have some joy. Find joy. Celebrate joy. Embody joy. If you're grumpy, you're going to just hit someone, right? And be like, you have some joy. <laughs> right. Right. So, you know, when we're talking about this rather amorphous concept, what do you think is an unafflicted joy? A joy that doesn't have a disturbing emotion present with it. How would you describe something like that? How would you describe a joy that doesn't have a disturbing emotion with it? Something that's a settled, deep contentment. What's that like? Where does it come from? It's for real. For real? <laughs> for real? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, we have to sit with it a little bit. What is joy as opposed to what? Maybe it's easier to understand by contrast what's something that seems like joy but isn't. Like excitement. Mm, a quick fix. Right? A quick fix. A yep. Um, you know, sort of, yeah, temporary pleasures. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think there must be an element of trust 
in what's giving you the joy. Mm. Trust that it's stable, that it's valid. Yep. Otherwise, it's like excitement or yep. a little bit jaded. Yep, and it might have like anticipation with it and expectation mm. with it, so it does sort of work for a minute. Mm. There's got to be mm. a solid foundation mm -hmm. of what's giving it to you. Yep. What would be a solid foundation? I would say the Dharma and my teachers. Yep, yep, which really means your mind's development, isn't it? Your mind's development is really all you can rely on, isn't it? Um, yep, the people may or may not work for joy giving, right, on a good day. Right, and even on a good day, they were just a condition. They weren't the substantial cause. Because you could be with your favorite people, and if you're in a bad mood, it doesn't help anyway, right? Um, and so then equanimity, what is equanimity to you? In terms of a good quality that you would want to develop, what would that kind of equanimity, how would you describe it? Freedom from turbulence. Oh, interesting, yeah, freedom from turbulence. No chaos. Yep. Yeah, it sounds like there's some stability in there. Yes. Even keel. And not overly attached to, you know, the outcomes. And yeah, and yeah, absolutely. Not attached to outcomes. Yep. Related to other people, what is equanimity? An absence of partiality. Yep, exactly. Yep, an absence of partiality. Yep, which, is that the same thing as neutral? No, no. Okay. Just checking. <laughs> just checking. Just checking. Because that's the easiest misunderstanding, isn't it? You say, oh, I'm feeling equanimous. Sort of makes it sound like you're feeling nothing or you're feeling neutral. And that's not at all what's being described. But it's an easy place to go with it just because of the nature of the word and the root of the word being equal, isn't it? So, um, Annie, La, would you mind um, flipping the board for me? Oh, it's that little black thing in the center. Just push it down. There you go. Beauty. All right, and then push it down again. Sorry, I should have just got up. <laughs> Cheers. Beauty. So first of all, we love this black marker, right? Like, how great is this black marker? I'm so excited about it. Let's just take a moment. <laughs> Usually whiteboard markers are so unclear. Um, okay, so um, <laughs> how did we go? Then just kind of like our best guess, did it marry up a little bit with what's described here? And so before you check, let's just unpack what's being uh, described on the board, which is... For each of these four, there is what's called the near enemy and the far enemy, which is the near enemy is the thing that looks like it, right? That looks like the good quality that we want, but it's not that. It's an afflicted version. The far enemy is like its exact opposite. Okay, so when you were thinking about love, would you, you it sounds like a lot of you did naturally think something that looks like love but isn't would be attachment. Yeah. And then the opposite of love being anger, does that make sense? Especially if we define anger as the wish to harm. So if we define love as the wish for others to have happiness, then the wish for them to suffer would be an opposite, wouldn't it? Yeah. So what we're trying to capture here is really what is the essence of the thing that we want to have and then what stands in opposition to that? What blocks us from having it fully? Because if it was enough to think love is a good idea, we would be loving all the time. But we're not even loving all the time to the people we like. Never mind the people we don't like. Never mind strangers. We don't have consistent, unbiased goodwill and affection even towards our family. We get annoyed with them. We get impatient with them, right? The love dissipates. We want to say, I love you even when I'm mad at you. But what's actually true is while you're mad at them, you don't love them in that moment. There is a good continuity and foundation of love and trust that will carry you through that unfortunate moment. But in that exact moment, you don't love them. Yeah, And that's the difficult thing to reconcile in your mind is that two contrary states of mind cannot abide at the same exact time. They can flicker back and forth very quickly. A mental moment, um, they say if you were to snap your fingers and divide it into 64, one sixty-fourth of a finger snap is how quick a mental moment is. Okay, so it could feel like I love you, I hate you, simultaneously, when in fact they alternate. 
And this is a little bit of a tough pill to swallow, especially if you're thinking about something vulnerable like a child, and you think, I don't wish them harm. Well, you don't wish them harm in a sort of obvious way, but when you're very impatient with, say, a child who's not behaving the way you want them to, and you feel yourself getting tight or getting cold or getting boiling or however your response is, you're wanting to know they're doing the wrong thing. And there's an element of kind of punishing them for that, even if the punishment is withdrawing your affection, right? It's not like you're punishing them by whipping them, at, right? It's, but there's still an element of punishment. Yeah, I'm withdrawing my love, I'm withdrawing my friendly face, I'm withdrawing affection. So, you know, that's, that's cringy for us because we want to be good, kind, loving people. But unless we acknowledge the fact that when anger is present, love is not, we will never be able to develop and grow love. It will stay kind of as it is, coming and going inconsistently. Thoughts? It does, it does, and it's hard to do in the moment, right? It's hard to make yourself in the right state of mind in the moment of frustration, right? A lot of this work needs to be done privately, internally, by yourself, a good think, or a conversation with a friend you can play with ideas about that's not gonna turn into an argument. You need to kind of suss it out objectively before you can kind of bring it home to yourself and your own experience. Because to bring it directly home to your own personal experience very soon, it can kind of trigger a shame flood, which then can trigger a bit of defensiveness and then can make you give up and say to hell with it. Yeah, so you have to kind of tread delicately when you're approaching personal change. You know, it helps to start objectively with let's just play with this as a concept and then bring it in. I go. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's cringy, right? It's embarrassing and it's, it's almost heartbreaking because mm -hmm. you think, this person I really care about, I lost care for. Mm -hmm. That's not who I want to be. Yeah. And, you know, again, underlying all of this is the Buddhist concept that everything is interdependent, everything dependently arises, so your responses don't come out of nowhere. We need to take responsibility for them, but they're not our fault. It's a thin line, right? to take responsibility for your behavior, take responsibility for your responses, while at the same time not thinking, therefore I am bad, or I'm miswired or badly wired, or there's something wrong with me. It's that, you know, you made sense given your context like everyone else. Yeah, so it's much easier to change if you can hold that, you know, the way I behave makes sense given my history. I need to take responsibility for it, but it's not all my fault. It's also not my parents' fault, although it helps to kind of check in with that, right? But, you know, it's like, all right, so I learned some ways from that lot I grew up with, and they made sense given their context. You know, doing a bit of that work does help, but at some point you just look, is it still useful? Is it still useful? It came from somewhere, made sense from somewhere. Is it still serving a function? That's the thing to check. Yeah, then you don't get lost in defensiveness and justification. You just go, all right, I've been doing this for years, probably annoying people for years. I'm a bit embarrassed that only now am I noticing. However, now that I've noticed, I can move on. It takes a bit of objectivity, doesn't it, with your own kind of way of living in the world, but it's still, it's really vital that you do that, otherwise change can't happen. That's a kind of loving yourself. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Remembering that, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Blame is not useful, isn't it? Responsibility is useful. Blame is not useful. But it's also not accurate, right? It's not only not useful, it's not true. Yeah, it's not true. There are many, many elements in every single behavior, every single interaction. And to sort of isolate one component and say, here's where the problem is, is an exaggeration. Because missing one or two of the other components, it wouldn't have happened. Does it make sense? Yeah, so thinking I am bad is an exaggeration. Yeah, it's an oversimplification. Um, 
so when we're looking at attachment, we have to really clarify what is attachment. Because attachment is used in many different contexts, sometimes with a positive connotation, isn't it? Right? Sometimes attachment is seen as a good thing. Right? So what is negative attachment or attachment from a Buddhist perspective? What does it mean? Why is it not so good? There's, there's an element of clinging. Yep, there's clinging. Absolutely clinging. How does it view the thing it's attached to? It's over. Yeah. yeah, over. Yeah, it over, over, um, oversells it in your mind. It exaggerates it. Um, and th this is why it's, uh, it's very difficult to unpack attachment because it does see the good qualities. Yeah? Attachment does see the good qualities of a person or an object, but it exaggerates their importance. Mm -hmm. It exaggerates um, them in terms of isolating it from the rest of the story. Right? Um, it exaggerates it in terms of um, how much you need it to be near you in order to be happy. It or them. Like yeah. being in love. It's sort of delusory. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You complete me. That's unfortunate. <laughs> they go. <laughs> right? Right? But I mean, that's what attachment says, is that I need you in order to be happy. Yeah. Yep. Or there's, only, there's a certain kind of happiness I can only have when you are here which then makes it true, but it wasn't true until you decided that, right? And that's what attachment does, is that it makes our needs excessively specific, yeah? Human connection is important. As an ordinary being on an ordinary level of the path to enlightenment, we need human connection. We do. But we don't need that human connection, that particular one right there. Really, any old person will do, yeah? <laughs> Yeah, feeling at one with humanity just means that you feeling connection internally. You can be completely alone in your cave and feel at one with humanity, and at a dinner party with your favorite people and feel totally alone. We know this. You can feel totally alienated, surrounded by loved ones, and you can feel very connected if you're connected in your meditation. So attachment says otherwise. It says, I need you in order to be happy. And what's more, I don't just need you. I need certain responses from you. I need certain behaviors from you. I just would like the best version of you, please. Only that one, not the other versions. So when you choose a partner, you are more happy with that person than another one. It's normal, no? Sure, sure. Otherwise, why'd but you hang out? It doesn't really make you happy. So you really would not have it with yeah, it's not to say that we don't have more rapport with some people than others, right? We do have more rapport with some people than others in terms of more things in common, more things we relate to. People will be, some people will be more in our life than others, but what we're trying to do with attachment is to, real, is to realize that attachment says from their own side they are making me feel this way, when the truth is it's from the side of your projections and what you've decided is necessary for closeness. Is it viewed through a lens of ego? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it is. It's viewed through, through a lens of ego of what benefits this I, what supports this I, what validates it. Yeah. So then, you know, <laughs> we've got to take a moment for that, right, and have a think. Because what happens when attachment doesn't get what it wants is anger, right? When love doesn't get what it wants, it checks to see what's wrong, it looks to the other person to see what's up. It looks internally to see, have I done the wrong thing? It's much more peaceful and gently analytical and able to see a wider view. That's what love is able to do because it's not agitated. Attachment is clingy and agitated, and when it doesn't get what it wants, it implodes or it explodes, right? You either become depressed or you become angry. That's what happens when attachment doesn't get what it wants. So that's how you know if attachment was there. That's why divorces are horrible, right? If they were people that truly loved each other and then didn't want to be together anymore because it just wasn't working out logistically, you had different priorities for your life, it kind of came to an end, you'd have a hearty handshake and say, thanks for the memories. That is not the way it usually goes, right? Occasionally you'll see a good divorce, right? Occasionally you're like, well done, you two. That was, that was good. But usually, it's an explosion of some kind. Yeah, and when you know, somebody is very, very angry, or someone is very, very sad, or they ping pong between sad and mad, and that is because there was not the percentage of love there that there was percentage of attachment. 
and attachment didn't get what it wanted, so it threw a tantrum. And that is embarrassing because grief is real and hurts, right? Grief is real and it hurts, and it's not to minimize the pain of that. But to realize that we did do that to ourselves means we don't do it again, or less so, less often. Yeah? Does attachment also mean that we want whatever we attach to stay permanently? Yeah, so? absolutely. There's that element of grasping at permanence in attachment, uh, expecting a stability that isn't possible, expecting a consistency that can never be. Yeah, we, we see the person's good qualities and then think they can always be that way. Yeah, um, and, and think even, you know, especially in the beginning of a friendship or a romantic relationship or a new workplace dynamic, people are kind of on their best behavior, mm. right? They're on their best behavior and so more of their good qualities are obvious more of the time. And then people start to, sl you know, slip back into their old ways. Yeah, but even if they don't, even if they really try and be on their best behavior all the time, People can't be on their best behavior all the time because no one is that mindful and that focused. Mm -hmm. People get tired. People get hungry. People have disappointing things happen during the day, and then they react, unfortunately, to them. And when you see that side of someone for the first time, you're disappointed because you have attachment. Right? You wouldn't be disappointed if you didn't have attachment. You'd say that is the spectrum of the human condition. It's to be, that's to be expected. That's the real expectation is that people will fail you. If you think people will not fail you, how dare they fail you, it, that people should be consistent and will always be consistent, it is setting yourself up, right? Because mm. what has your life shown you so far, right? <laughs> people are a little dodgy, right? Bless them, but they are, right? They forget, they get distracted, they mean well and then forget. It's what happens, isn't it? But when we're attached to people, we take a snapshot in our mind of our best version of them. And then any time they're not that best version, we're a little annoyed. Do you reckon? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so this is the thing that I think is so interesting when you see people like His Holiness the Dalai Lama is that when he meets people, after about a minute, it looks like they've been friends for 20 years. He has this immediate rapport, this immediate closeness, and, you know, and then you think, oh, actually, they just met. Yeah, right. And the other person at first is sort of, like, intimidated by who he is, and then they settle down, and they have this, like, really beautiful conversation. You know, every panel discussion you see with His Holiness kind of goes that way, where there's a moment of intimidation. He usually does something to break the ice, some sort of cute joke or something, some beard tugging, right, some nose tweaking, just some classics, right? And, and then they get on with the conversation, either about science or uh, quantum physics or neuroscience or psychology or, you know, other aspects of Buddhism. And it's a beautiful conversation between hu two human beings, but at a heart-to-heart -heart level. Mm -hmm. And this is what happens when we don't have attachment, is we can feel close to anyone and everyone. Yeah. And part of your mind will say, I don't want to feel close to everyone because some people are yucky. Right? <laughs> um, but... Think of what it does to you when you don't like being around someone. Never mind what it does to them. What does it feel like when you don't like someone? Mm -hmm. You're uncomfortable, right? Mm -hmm. right? And this is the thing is that it feels like they gave you that feeling, right? But if you felt sort of generally related and connected to all sentient beings, you wouldn't be uncomfortable. Yeah, it feels like they gave you that, didn't it? But not. Nah. <laughs> right? So this is, this is the problem with attachment. So we, we just kind of, you know, we'll, we'll play with this sucker and we'll do some meditations on that after the tea break. <clears throat> but to just hold it in your mind that attachment hurts me and it makes me have unrealistic expectations of people that are bound to be disappointed. And this is at the root of many of my human conflicts. Yeah, and many of the conflicts I have internally with myself, I see my own best qualities, I see my own best version, and then assume I can live up to that with consistency. Right? We all have a little perfectionist inside of us that knows what we're capable of on a really good day. Yeah? A really good day, we know what we're capable of. And then if we don't live up to that every <coughs> single day, it's like we're disappointed and go into self-loathing. Do you think that ever happens, right? You know, what, you know what you could do on a really good day, and then you're like, why can't I do that all the time? And we make plans based on that really good one, right? But, you know, 
Sometimes we eat the wrong thing and the day is ruined. <laughs> right? Sometimes we don't get enough sleep, right? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So attachment, we can have attachment to ourselves as well. We have attachment to situations, attachment all over the shop. But here we're talking about getting rid of attachment towards um, other human beings, other living beings in general. Um, compassion, you know, is the other side of love, which is the wish for people to be free from suffering, right? And so they go together, which means their far enemy is very much the same, right? The opposite of compassion is like cruelty and ill will, right? So the opposite for both love and compassion is quite similar. But the near enemy of compassion is actually, I think, in some ways harder to catch because it's more socially acceptable, right? Something that looks like compassion but isn't, yes, of course, is pity, but what looks like compassion but isn't also can be things like grief, and empathic distress, and um, just the stress that you feel when you see someone else's suffering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you see someone else's struggling, and you start to feel a little bit stressed by that, you might think that's compassion. Yeah, uh, have you ever had this happen where you're like watching the news and feeling really bad for the people struggling with whatever war or natural disaster, and you're starting to feel a bit sad mm -hmm. in response to that observation? That is not necessarily compassion, yeah? Feeling sad in response to seeing suffering is not compassion. And feeling distress is, um, I think it's a physical reaction to what you don't control as a human. Mm. Um, yeah, when I see, because I'm working in a hospital, when I see yeah. someone suffering and pain, yeah. I feel in my body. Absolutely. Mm. It's, you know, there's something out there that we can't get. There's a difference, I think, between being able to respond to someone else's suffering, being able to see it clearly, having it touch your heart, and being sucked into it and feeling paralyzed by it. Do you know this difference, yeah. right? So some days you can see someone else's suffering and it touch your heart, and you become strategic in a kind way like is there something that can be done are there some conditions i can help alter to make them more comfortable are there things i can say or ways i can be to make them more comfortable but when it's real compassion if you if the conclusion is no there's nothing i can do you don't become disappointed in yourself or angry at them or angry at the situation you just wait for another window of opportunity whereas when it's something that looks like compassion but isn't you get more and more distressed because you can't fix it, mm -hmm. right? You can't fix it and you're disappointed in yourself. You can't fix it and you get agitated seeing them that way when, you know, that's not compassion. But they often go together or alternate with the same situation. Yeah, we'll go from compassion to kind of empathic distress. Um, what happens too is that we, we might have really good empathy and the ability to feel with someone's situation and then we get sucked in and start to identify with it, and all of our stuff comes up. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting to observe when, um, when I do hospice work in Brisbane. Um, as soon as, um, if there's someone new to the organization who's not used to being around death, as soon as um, there's a, a very pressing death about to happen, and then it happens, and the funeral and all of that, the person who hasn't bared witness to death very often often gets a bit kind of giddy yeah, they might sort of um, get agitated and start, I don't know, cleaning things unnecessarily, right? They might get kind of very busy with things. Um, or they might kind of um, tell jokes to lighten the mood, but in a neurotic way, not a skillful way. Um, you know, th there's just an agitation that happens because their own issues around death have been triggered. Yeah, and so it's kind of like they're having this response of helping, but actually it's not coming from compassion. It's coming from a real agitated mind. It's like, this is uncomfortable. Uh, I have to make a job. <laughs> Let's find a task. Let's find something tangible to do. And it's understandable. Yeah, it's natural to get that way. But what happens over time is you have to deal with your own stuff around that topic, and the more you work with it, the less you bring your baggage to the bedside of someone else. Yeah, have you ever talked to someone about like a relationship breakup and they immediately tell you about their old breakups? 
And they're, in a way, they're like trying to empathize and sympathize and connect with you, but also they've been triggered into their own stuff. And it depends, you know, the same words of a conversation could be two different versions, right? Here's my, here's my relationship breakup story, could be pure compassion, but often it's, oh, that has just triggered me and now I'm going to need to sort through it, right? So w the things that look like compassion and aren't, aren't necessarily the words or the behaviors, it's really looking at your own internal thought process of am I jumping in because I'm uncomfortable with this con with this topic and changing it or making a reference that's not necessary? Or am I jumping in because I really have a way to try and bring out an insight from them? <coughs> do, you, do you know the difference? Mm -hmm. do, do, can you think at least about the difference when um, someone else has been compassionate to you as opposed to pity? Right? You can feel it right away when it's pity, right? Because you're like annoyed. Yeah, <laughs> and you're like, you know, but someone who has compassion towards you, there's a huge amount of respect there. Yeah, and space. Yeah, can you think of when someone's been really compassionate towards you? There's just been a lot of room for you to be however you happen to be in that suffering moment. Yeah. Thoughts? It, look, it's something to play with because, again, like attachment and love, distress and compassion, you know, it's, they can look very similar and you can have the same behavior when you're motivated the right way and when you're motivated the wrong way. The external behavior and words might be the same either way. Yeah, um, because also we get kind of habits of how we deal with trouble. Yeah, so sometimes we're phoning it in, <laughs> right? And these are the things I do when someone is sad like this, you know, like a wind up toy, go, yeah. Um, and sometimes we're very present with it, and it's a really beautiful unfolding response motivated by compassion. But we have to do this work as an individual to check which one is it for me at this moment, at this time. Any questions about that one? Near and far enemies? If it gets too toasty, open a door. Okay. So, <laughs> um, okay, so joy. Um, joy, the near enemy, is like hedonic happiness, right? So excited, bouncy, bouncy, right? Um, worldly pleasure, getting worked up, yeah? Which seems like happiness, right? It does seem like happiness, but it's a bit like sugar seems like a meal, <laughs> right? And you do feel sort of happy and sustained for a second, and then there's a crash, Right? Right? It's like that. So the near enemy being this worldly pleasure or hedonic happiness, um, it's, it's tricky to identify because, uh, you know, the joy we want to cultivate is both an internal joy and also like a sympathetic joy, which is happy when that others are happy. Happy for other people's happiness. Mm -hmm. And wishing other people happiness, but from the perspective of the spiritual path, may you have the happiness that is without suffering, may you have connection with your own path, your own path to awakening. So it's kind of a bigger wish than just kind of everyday love. It's a goodwill, but it's a goodwill that's also conditioned by you actually have the potential to be completely free from suffering. And that is what I really want for you. So the far enemy is jealousy. D is the relationship make sense or is it a little like what's, what's the relationship there? Why would jealousy be the opposite of this kind of like sympathetic joy? Want to help someone else happy. Yeah, yeah. You you want what someone else. Yeah, yeah. You feel like they don't deserve it. Um, why do they always get this? So you see their happiness and you're annoyed, <laughs> right? When you're in the real um, immeasurable joy, you see their happiness and you're happy. Yeah. Um, someone gets a, a promotion, you think, oh, fantastic, they really wanted that. Jealousy says, well, I could do that. <laughs> yeah, or they don't really deserve that. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's just referent in the wrong way, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> also is boredom. <laughs> you see someone else's happiness and you're kind of meh. <laughs> right? Um, so how do you cultivate caring for other people's happiness? What is the benefit in caring about other people's happiness? What does it do to your day when you see other people's happiness and you're happy about it? So 
like sort of exponential happiness. Yeah. It can make you ask what are the causes for happiness. It can make you curious about what are the ways to cultivate that within yourself. It can do a lot of different things, but when you're really wanting immeasurable joy, it's it's not that the other people actually have to be happy for you to be happy, right? It's not so neurotic and limited as that. It's that you're seeing their potential and that gives you joy. Yeah, you're seeing their potential and that gives you joy. So it's based very much on an idea that enlightenment is possible um, or at least development and change is possible for a human being. And so seeing windows of that in a person can give you that very deep joy Almost in the way, say, a parent seeing a child do well, how, you, you, you know, even if they don't even realize how well they're doing. Yeah, if, if a kid has been trying to learn a new sport or a new, I don't know, math problem or whatever it is, and they've been struggling on it, and they've just got a little window of progress that they haven't even noticed yet. Doesn't that make you really happy as like a parent or an auntie or whatever? You just, you're like so happy about their potential unfolding. You know that kind of joy? Look at you doing the right thing. Yeah, look at you progressing. Look at you connecting with your potential. That, that kind of joy. Um, it can also be this really interesting thing when you're with people that if you're listening for their wisdom, if you're listening for the wisdom in other people, you start to hear the wisdom of other people, right? When you're listening from a place of jealousy, you're always competitive. So someone could come out with like a real gem of an insight and it bugs you. Right? Someone could come out with something really insightful and you want to like one up them with a better insight. Right? This is what jealousy does to us is that it, it prevents us enjoying each other. Jealousy prevents us enjoying each other. It, there's always a subtle competition or a not so subtle competition when jealousy is present. Um, you know, it can happen with health, right? Who's the sickest one and bearing it the best, right? You know, this competition can be a uh, travel competition or um, experience competition or relationship competition, but you can feel it in a conversation when it started as sharing joy, mm -hmm. right? What's, you know, you just, how you been going, right? Just a normal everyday cup of coffee conversation. How you been going? Oh, the kids are doing this. My husband's been doing that. And it's just a really nice, oh, that's wonderful. Oh, that's wonderful. And you're like connecting and it's beautiful. And then it can like take a turn, right? <laughs> And you're like, oh, well, you know, my, my son graduated with honors. Yeah? Yeah? But you say it real subtle, right? You know, it's a humble brag, right? Just real subtle. Yeah, he, he happened to get into Oberlin. Yeah. You know, you just kind of slip it in there, right? And then the other person staying friendly, staying in the t same tone, staying in that same kind of we're sharing way, just slips in something their kid's done really amazing. But it's not a sharing anymore. It's a mine wins, right? <laughs> right? You know that feeling? <clears throat> so if we remember sort of how much jealousy stifles connection, doesn't it? Jealousy stifles connection. It blocks it. And joy of this connecting way, this is really the kind of thing that we're trying to work on throughout our whole spiritual path, which is just a heart connection with people. And one of the easiest ways to find a heart connection with people is to rejoice in something good they're doing. You immediately feel connected to them. Yeah, you immediately feel connected to them when you are in agreement with their good works or what they're about or the things that they're pursuing, don't you? Yeah, there's a heart connection. And that kind of heart connection can be deeply relaxing, whereas jealousy can be very anxious and unsettled. You know, why do we sometimes hate group gatherings? Is because there's very subtle threads of jealousy weaving all through it and, you know, power positioning and insecurities and everybody's stuff coming up and you're trying to find your place within this group and how can I, you know, kind of become the top dog? And it's nothing is necessarily even said. It's just these very subtle little tendrils of jealousy rather than pathways of connection. And that's why it's uncomfortable to be in a group. And that's also why it's lovely to be in a group if everybody's a bit settled down and just relaxed with it. Yeah. Yeah, maybe alcohol's not so bad, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe it makes you too vague to get too competitive. I don't know. It's been a long time. 
maybe it makes you worse, depends on the person, right? But, you know, think about when you're uncomfortable in a group of people, what is underneath and underneath and underneath that discomfort? Even if you wouldn't call it jealousy, you would probably name it as, I don't feel related to these people or connected to these people. I feel somehow alienated or suspicious of these people, you know, or these aren't my people. Who are these people? There's some sort of suspicion or some sort of discomfort, you know, uneasiness. When you're with a group of people and feeling that, it's interesting to just experiment in your mind at thinking about them and what might give them joy and purpose and meaning. And then suddenly you feel connected to the room. And the conversations you have are about sharing, not competing. And if they start competing, you don't get triggered, right? You're like, fair enough, that's what people do. And it can just roll off you, right? When you're triggered, you have to, you know, get into battle like that. Yeah? Is it making sense what I'm saying? Or do you have some, some doubts or, or um, debates about that? Yeah. It can be in a big group where you feel anonymous, but you want to feel alone, which is kind of the ego. Thing. Yeah. And that everything is conspiring against you being known. Yeah, right. Outside of the group. So yeah. That can be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, how will I get these people to know who I am? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> then surely they'll love me. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's it's an interesting thing, and you know, I was thinking about this the other day because I'm in airports a lot lately, and um, you know, people in airports really do stare at me a lot, right? They really do, right? A lot. Like it happens generally in life, but in airports it's more. And I was thinking, okay. I'm really, unco I get a little uncomfortable if it's been a long flight, like one or two flights, all right, but when it's like New Zealand to Israel and it takes like 30 hours and, you know, there's all these, st by the end of it, I'm like, could you all just mind your own business, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I can feel this edginess, right? And I was, I was thinking about this the other day because I want to feel connected to my fellow man, right? And in airports, people are bored, right? They're yeah. bored. And I am very tall, bald red woman. Of course, they're going to look at me, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Like, uh, <laughs> what do I expect, right? They are bored. I am giant and red. Okay, so I'm going to catch their eye and I need to just make peace with it, right? And you'd think after 15 years, I would have. But anyway, that's another story. Um, but what I was realizing is that I wasn't uncomfortable, actually, that they're staring at me. Because sometimes I can talk to a group of 300 people, everyone's staring at me. What I didn't like is the fact that I'm assuming they're judging me. Yeah, that's what I was getting uncomfortable and tired by, is that airport after airport, I was wearing myself down with the assumption of judgment, which probably is there, right, in all fairness, right? Yeah, right? Yeah, often it's curiosity, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. But, but isn't it funny? This is what we do to ourselves is we assume it's a negative judgment when it might be a curiosity. Um, we assume it's personal when in fact everybody's looking at everybody, right? Everybody is looking at it. And they're like, oh, look at that kid. That's a cute kid. Oh, look at that mother. They should be more patient. Oh, look at that coffee. Maybe I want some. This is what's going on at airports, right? And then someone sort of dramatic walks by. Everyone goes, oh, cool, something to look at. And anyway, maybe a croissant, right? Like it's not personal, but we tire ourselves out with jealousy. You know, and all of this is very ego stuff, isn't it? It's all about me. And we make ourselves tired because it's all about me. And as soon as, you know, I think of, you know, the good flights when I've just kind of relaxed into it and tried to really even think about how much everyone else is tense and stressed and trying to get at the right place at the right time and being squashed into tiny seats and, you know, blah, 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 all the tension that comes with travel. And I'm just really wanting to be a calming influence on everyone and, you know, even a source of amusement. If they're a very judgmental person who doesn't get a Buddhist path, may I make them laugh by my absurd appearance? Sure, if that lightens the mood, why not? You know, and when I'm in this really thinking of them, then I'm happy. And then I'm just regular tired at the end of the journey rather than like cosmically, psychically tired needing to recover in a hole, right? I'm just regular, physical, tired, have a snack and a nap, I'm good. Yeah. If you were doing all this traveling in a pair, like you had a fellow nun with you, yeah. wouldn't it be completely different? Yeah, yeah. The pressure you, would be off, absolutely. even if everything else was the same? Absolutely. That's interesting. Absolutely. It's like, we're like being judged. 
Yeah, exactly. You know, mm-hmm. it's a really good point. And, you know, when you feel like you're in it with someone else, mm-hmm. you are relaxed, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's the fascinating thing about why do support groups work? You would think it would make people more sad if everyone's going around talking about the loss of a loved one or everyone's talking about their anger management issues or everyone's talking about something like that. It should make everyone feel worse, but it makes you feel better knowing you're not in it alone. And the thing is, is that we're never in anything alone. Even if we're all by ourselves with this particular brand of suffering, all of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are completely aware of every aspect of this moment and rooting for us wishing us well, right? And, you know, connecting with that, then you're never alone. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a a frame of reference like that, if you don't have a spiritual view like that, that's okay. You can still think in terms of, now I'm connecting with the human condition, Mm -hmm. right? This is vital information for me to be able to touch the depth of the human condition, which is going to make me a better friend. It's going to make me better in my family, in my workplace, because it's another aspect of suffering I will have experienced directly and then can have compassion for others in a more direct way, not just a guessing way. Yesterday, I just want to share something um, about George and at my work, but, and I struggled with that yesterday because I was, uh, so I was working and one of my colleagues called Ken and said, oh, this one, She's always coming to me, telling me what to do. I don't like to do the work. Yeah. She, uh, she's very dominant. And, and uh, yeah, she, I, she forces me. And I feel like orphan. So coming back, so I say that. And actually, I got stuck there because I had the same problem with that person. And it took me two years to mm. have a smile for her and be a bit more, uh, she's very dominant mm. and very strict. And so, but I didn't want to say, yes, you are right. Yeah. I didn't want to encourage her to keep coming to me and saying bad things about others. And mm. so I was like, okay, so if we are 70 persons here, we can't be connected to everyone. We know where these people are. So mm. just, just keep making whatever. <laughs> but I see now that my answer was not right. And I like her because. Like, well, maybe it was a step, be, right? She okay yeah. with everybody, weakness and strength. This person is dominant, but she's a good, you know. Mm, yeah, exactly. Friendly. This one is really good too, but she she likes coming to me and telling me things on others she doesn't like. Yeah, right. So, yeah. And I was myself struggling with my difficulty too. That I like her, I don't like this one. Like yeah. I don't want to tell, and I'm trying actually to go over that. Yeah. And when it's just like such a yeah. No, and it's, I mean, it is, it's what we do to ourselves. Someone comes into the room, we're happier. Someone else comes into the room, we tense. And it could be that, um, you know, you don't have your glasses on that day and it could be opposite people, but you're having a response as if it's true. Yeah? You could think, oh, here's my favorite person coming into the room and we're totally relaxed, so happy that they're there, and then get a second look and realize it's not even them. But you've still had the response of relaxation. Right, Or you could see someone from a distance that you really dislike, start to tense up, get grumpy, go through the whole story of why they are bad and wrong, and it turns out it's not even them. But you've gotten yourself tense, as if that was a whole true story. And actually, if it is even that person, it's the same case, because it's a story. Yeah, it's a story that makes sense, but it's not the whole story. Um... So, you know, yeah, just so we're going to explore it a little bit. And, you know, an equanimity is, is one of those things that is really the basis for the other three and the basis for everything else. And it is so easy to misunderstand and to think now everyone is the same. The way that everyone is the same is that they want happiness and they don't want suffering. That's what's the same. But besides that, it's infinite variation, right? We're so different in a lot of ways. The surface stuff is quite different. We are the same in wanting happiness and not wanting suffering. Sometimes that alone can kind of pierce your tightness and pierce the barriers. Because someone that you really don't understand, you really don't agree with, you realize they're coming from that same place. They have totally different strategies than you. Maybe mistaken strategies. But they're coming from the same place. They just want to be happy. They don't want to suffer. They think what they're doing is giving them that. Just like I think what I'm doing is giving me that. And sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Same is true for them. Poignant, relatable, right? Sometimes that alone is enough. Sometimes that alone is not enough. 
Sometimes we have to make it the wise selfishness that realizes that actually everyone benefits us if we look at it the right way. And even if we don't look at it the right way, they are benefiting us. The worst person in your life, the worst things in your life, have done many good things for you in terms of resiliency. Equanimity is tricky because it's like, it feels like then you have to give them credit for that, <laughs> right? If someone was terrible and did horrible things in your life, it doesn't mean they meant to. They probably didn't, yeah? The people that do the wrong thing in our life and have harmed us in some way probably did want to harm us, or at least were distracted and didn't realize how much harm they were giving. But from our side, if we think that was an incredible benefit, because now I understand more about humans, now I understand more about myself, now I have more skills of empathy, more skills of, you know, I don't know, resilience that makes me want to progress and understand the reasons why people behave this way. If you believe in karma, it's exhausted old negative karma, etc., etc. right? Um, then you try and even out your friendships and your um, romantic relationships and your family relationships by thinking, actually, they don't always benefit me. Yeah, you want closeness partially because of sense of benefit. But actually, there are many naughty things that we do because of our friends that we wouldn't do without them. Do you agree? Like, for example, you might not ever gossip with a stranger but with your best friend, you will be critical and biting. Yeah. yeah. You know, so, so we're trying to even things out. We're not trying to then look down on our friends and look up at our enemies. We're trying to even it out in terms of there is benefit and lack of benefit depending on how I look at it. But I want these ones close because I think they help me. And I want those ones far away because I think they don't. And these strangers I'm indifferent to because they do nothing for me. And that whole story is an incomplete story. Most of our benefit comes from strangers, right? Our cars, our clothes, our food, etc. This is mostly the work of strangers, and yet we have complete indifference to them. Yeah? Friends and family seem like these are the ones that help me, that look after me, that have my back. But they are also sometimes the ones that enable us and allow bad behavior and maybe prevent change because they don't want to see us change, blah, 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 evening it out. The enemies are essential because how else would you know what your um, gaps are, <laughs> right? If you only had nice, kind people around you, you could start to think you had no work to do on the spiritual path. You'd be like, I'm doing quite well. I'm patient. I'm friendly. Well, sure you are if no one's being rude, right? <laughs> We're all really nice if there's no rude people, right? Um, but, you know, the things that you learn having to deal with a rude person or a harmful person serve you well in then all these other areas, right? If you had, like, um, a tyrant boss, if you ever had a tyrant boss, just a terrible boss, total control freak, ego trip, weirdo, yeah? Then if you have just kind of a little bit of a micromanager boss down the track, you're like, oh, I can deal with this, isn't it? If you'd only just had the kind of like mildly annoying boss, then that would be a big deal to you. But if you had this horrible tyrant years ago, everything is kind of no big deal. Yeah, and you can figure out ways to navigate with it. Isn't it? It's interesting. So, so what we're trying to do is to get rid of not a sense of the categories, friend, enemy, and stranger, but the idea that these categories dictate the amount of goodwill that we should have. Yeah? That makes sense? Or the amount of, um, I guess, push and pull, because it's the push and pull that makes the mind agitated and disturbs our clarity of mind and makes wisdom harder to access. So when we like people, we have a subtle pulling them towards energy of attachment. Come here, come closer. I like you around me. Yeah, and then when they go, there's a bit of a, you know, like a rubber band snapped, like, oh, but I wanted you near, <laughs> right? <laughs> and when there's someone we don't like, we have this kind of like, uh, just please go, please go energy. Yeah, just a little bit more space, a little bit away, get away, get away. And, you know, and if they come closer, we feel sort of suffocated. Yeah, and people that we're indifferent to, we can be very sort of wispy and hazy and kind of um, vague about. Yeah, so you know none of those are helpful in terms of our spiritual path. Push and pull and vaguing out and indifference, all of these things disturb our clarity of mind and make us less effective in the world. 
Yeah. It's a good way to think of it. With indifference, you sort of create your own cocoon. Mm. Equanimity is being moved towards. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's like it opens out. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and a cocoon keeps you very insular. Yep. So, um, the near in enemy is obviously indifference and apathy, right? Things that look like equanimity but aren't, right? Is when you just kind of like, oh, it's no big deal. Oh, no worries. Oh, it's fine. Oh, it's fine. But really, you just don't care. <laughs> right <laughs> you seem really cruisy and really relaxed but really you just don't care um the far enemy is partiality as jill was saying and just good old classic prejudice right these are the good people these are the bad people these are the people i want near me these are the people i don't want near me here are good people here are bad people those kind of hard and fast classifications not useful not equanimity but of course very normal and natural to us so we have to catch them um, we have to catch them, otherwise they will dictate our life forever, right? Um, and again, remember what it does to you. When you have a prejudice, you see someone in the category of your prejudice and you're immediately uncomfortable. And they might be the nicest person ever, but you've now done that to yourself, right? Yeah, so um, sit with that. <laughs> sit with that. And um, in the break, I just have a short handout for today. Tomorrow there's a bit more of an extended handout. But this, um, this is a reading by Thich Nhat Hanh, and um, it's from the Mindfulness Bell publication that you can find free online, so if you want to share it with anybody. But um, basically it just gives some context again about um, the four immeasurable thoughts and a little outline of each one of them, and he puts things in a really nice accessible way. So that's just a reading for in-between sessions. And um, because this is a workshop, this um, uh, isn't in any kind of silence or anything. So if you want to connect and talk to each other at the tea break, by all means. And if you want some space to just digest, there's lots of seating outside. And, you know, and if you have the body language of I'm reading, I'm sure people will leave you alone. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, are there any questions? Um, I think we're probably too full with information and uh, heat from the room to do a meditation. So we'll do it after the tea break. Um, but are there any questions before we break? Or things that you particularly want to cover in the weekend? Actually, just a general question, maybe sure. not related exactly. Just because you uh, did, um, described that incident when you were in the Air Force. Mm. Um, and I know that in Maddie, every reason and um, People have a, like a different form of attire they wear. Mm -hmm. So I'm just uh, my question is that the spiritual journey is more internal, and I mean yeah. definitely it affects externally. How does that make a difference if somebody is wearing a particular type of attire or? Yeah, yeah. What's the what's the purpose of robes? Yeah, exactly. yeah What's the purpose? It's yeah. It's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I guess first of all, the um, the reason why there's a difference in clothes is that uh, during the Buddhist time, he said renunciates or monks and nuns um, should wear the unfashionable color, right? They, and so he gave three options of unfashionable color. And um, based on the culture, um, we pick the one that's unfashionable for that culture. So like in, uh, in Taiwan, um, you know, this color, this kind of royal maroony kind of color is seen as quite a fancy color in Taiwan. So they wear like earth tones, right? And only their very high abbots have kind of a red robe that they wear, but they wear more earth tones. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, you'll see a variation of colors, but it's based on what is not fashionable. And uh, the style also um, evolves, you know, through the years, through the decades, through the hundreds of years, you know, depending on um, the climate, depending on the dyes and the fabrics that were available. The standard thing for all Buddhist monks and nuns um, is having this arm out, this right arm out, which is showing that you don't carry any weapons. Um, it's, you know, a safety and it's also a respect. Um, and you'll see in a lot of the sutras, um, when, his, when the students of the Buddha wanted to ask a question, they would um, circumambulate him three times, kneel on their right knee, and uncover their right shoulder. So even the non-monks and nuns, is, you know, sort of as a show of respect. Um, so anyway, we all have that one shoulder out business. Um, so the reason for an external thing, it's really because we are creatures of the sensory world, right? While we're still on the path, while we're still practicing, we are influenced by our senses, eyes, ears, nose, etc. right? And so for a, someone who's living a very renounced life or trying to, having clothes that remind them of that helps you stay on track, yeah. right? It really helps you stay on track. It reminds you of your own path. 
Um, and then for people that are of your same religion or your same practice, seeing you reminds them of their practice, even if you're in a terrible mood that day, right? <laughs> but they can be like, oh yeah, monks and nuns, oh yeah, samsara is terrible, oh yes, must get out, be kind, hopefully is what one would think when they see robes, right? Um, and then when we see our own robes, we're reminded of our vows. Um, so, you know, like the particular Tibetan formation, the bottom half has four big folds in it that represent the four noble truths. So when you're getting dressed, you're remembering what to adopt and what to abandon. Um, you know, these are um, the fangs of Yama to remind us of death. Yes, so that's good, right? Every morning, death is coming, right? Remembering that. Um, there's a little blue border because um, when Buddhism came from China and India into Tibet, there wasn't quite enough um, monks for the quorum to make a new monk that we had to borrow some from China ironically, um, <laughs> and um, to make the full quorum of fully ordained monks who were of enough seniority to make a new monk. Um, and so in thanks to China, we wear this blue strip. Mm. Yeah, irony. Yeah, mm. so etc. Anyway, all the bits have a meaning, but um, it's really to remind ourselves. Yeah, and uh, it makes you hold yourself to a different standard on the days that you don't feel like it, and then you wind up having behaviors and habits that are better and better. It's kind of like if you're wearing a uniform at work, you probably um, are trying to live up to a standard, yeah, that sort of um, embodies that workplace. Um, and so it's, it's just a good way of kind of holding, holding your um, awareness of what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Like that. Yeah. For lay people, it seems. For lay people? Yeah. Oh, yes, in theory. Yep, yeah, sure. Well, Yep, absolutely. I mean, you know, like a wedding ring, right? What is a wedding ring for, right? It's, you know, to remind you of your vows, to show other people that you've got some, I don't know why, I don't know why y'all do it, but anyway, it seems like a good idea, right? Something kind of tangible, friendly reminder. I don't know why you do it, but something must be something similar, right? A reminder of a commitment. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, there's also, um, there's something protecting as well right, in um, remembering what you've already decided is a good idea, right, because when you forget what you decided is a good idea, you can kind of fall back into old habits and then be very disappointed in yourself, yeah, whereas if you're kind of vividly reminded of all of the changes that you've decided are important to you, then it's much easier to stay on track, but of course, eventually at some point in your path, it wouldn't matter if you were a monk or a nun or a lay person at all, it's, um, it's for folks that flourish with structure, yeah. Yep, some people would find it a prison. Some people find it quite liberating. And so it's kind of a personality thing as well. Yeah. Any other um, miscellaneous <laughs> before we call it a break? Okay, so we'll, um, we'll stop for a cup of tea and um, we'll come back at uh, 11.30. Oh, I see, I pushed it, sorry. I misread it. So, um, let's... It's really 15 now. Yeah, just bump it along. Yeah, 11.50. Yeah, okay, sorry. I didn't even read the proper schedule. I beg your pardon. Okay.